On This Week in Enterprise Tech, Windows for All, Security for Some People, and VMware is here to talk about storage. Quiet on the set. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This, this is Twit. Bandwidth for This Week in Enterprise Tech is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. It's time for Twit's annual audience survey, and we want to hear from you. Please visit twit.tv slash survey and let us know what you think. It only takes a few minutes, and your anonymous feedback will help us make Twit even better. We thank you so much for your continued support. Twit.tv slash survey. This is Twyatt. This Week in Enterprise Tech, Episode 132, recorded March 20th, 2015. VMware Storage Operations Manager. This Week in Enterprise Tech is brought to you by HipChat. Collaborate, save time, and be more productive with your teams. HipChat is IM, video chat, plus file code and screen sharing all in one place. Invite your team members and get a free 30-day trial of the full version of HipChat at hipchat.com slash twiet. And by Nitro. Nitro accelerates the way businesses create, prepare, and sign PDF files anytime, anywhere saving you and your business time. To learn more and try it free for 14 days, visit gonitro.com slash twit. That's gonitro.com slash twit. Welcome to Twy This Week in Enterprise Tech. It's the show dedicated to the enterprise professional, the IT pro, and the geek who just wants to know how the world is connected. I'm your host, Father Robert Ballaser, the digital Jesuit, your guide to all things in the enterprise, and, of course, I'm guiding you with my friends, my colleagues, my co-hosts, starting with Mr. Brian Chi, the director of the Advanced Network Computing Laboratory in Honolulu, Hawaii. Brian, welcome back. Hey, Padre. It's good to see you, my friend. How are things over in uh, paradise? I am busier than ever. And, by the way, uh, shout out to one of our fans that works for AT&T building APNs. Um, we're actually taking a really, really hard look at building a private APN just for the Hawaii Natural Energy Institute so that we can, um, you know, kind of get our um, 3G data collection all over the state under control. Show off. Well, someone who else, someone else who is showing off quite a bit these days is my other co-host, co -host, Mr. Curtis Franklin <laughs> from Information Week Radio. Gosh, it would be nice if my words worked. Well, I mean, that that's asking a lot, Padre, especially after the, the kind of week that we've had off uh, on the road. Uh, I get to be home for almost four whole days before I head back out again. So it's nice being able to come to you straight from the swamp. Well, we don't have much time before we all have to get active again. So let's make the best of it by jumping into some enterprise blips. Let's start off with China. It's got some cyber game. Now, in a shocking, shocking, I tell you, well, maybe surprising, more of interesting. Okay, in a completely expected non-surprise, an official document out of Beijing has confirmed that China employs special units to wage cyber warfare. One of the worst kept secrets in digital warfare, it's nonetheless refreshing to see Beijing drop the charade and own up to the fact that it runs a cyber command that focuses on three different types of cyber warfare. First, they have military units that specialize in network attack and defense. Secondly, they have civilian units that carry out network warfare operations, a nice way of saying influence and sentiment trolling on a national scale. Finally, they have what they call external entities, which are the equivalent of network black ops team that can be used for special operations. Now, Target settles a security score for peanuts. When we talk about enterprise security here at Twyatt, someone always asks why corporate executives aren't willing to spend big bucks for security. This week brings us the answer in the form of the $10 million proposed settlement in the major lawsuit stemming from Target's infamous security breach. Remember that this was a huge breach with millions of customers affected. Remember that it cost the CIO and CEO their jobs. Remember that it was a PR nightmare. Now, remember that it's being settled for less than the cost of a bag of Target Cafe popcorn for each affected user. Remember all of that when we have our next conversation about the cost of enterprise security, you can bet it's etched in stone in corporate boardrooms across North America. 
Well, an apology to our friends at Microsoft because there's a bogus SSL certificate out for Windows Live. Microsoft is having a truly bad day. A bogus SSL certificate for Windows Live seems to be out there, and Microsoft is scrambling to put the kibosh on it before a passel of man-in-the-middle attacks can appear. The bummer is that SSL certs are easy to issue, but not so easy to kill, since each browser maker has to issue an update to kill that particular cert. Let's hope the browser boys of spring do their updates quickly before it comes be becomes the dog days of summer. Well, the SSL hardship isn't limited to Microsoft. If you're running OpenSSL, patch now. That's the message that came out of OpenSSL yesterday when they released the details of several serious bugs in OpenSSL. One exploit can be used to force null pointer results, which could be used to disable programs running on affected servers, essentially a DOS attack. A second bug, CVE-2015-0204, builds on the freak smack exploit to allow the running of man-in-the-middle attacks on secure communications. The bug affects any OS using OpenSSL 102, 101, 100, and 098. But caution is the better part of valor, so if you're running any OS with OpenSSL, take some private time today and update, update, update. The paperless office could arrive in a creative cloud. People in the IT industry have been touting the arrival of the paperless office since about the time that I got into the game, back when Charlie Chaplin was still selling IBM PCs. Paper hasn't gone away for a lot of reasons, but some of those reasons may be going away if Adobe has anything to say about it. The image and metrics giant has announced the Adobe Document Cloud, their third cloud, which joins the creative and marketing clouds. Adobe Document Cloud relies on a new touch and mobile focused version of the company's Acrobat software that can digitize paper documents called Acrobat DC. Acrobat DC relies on Photoshop technology to convert photos of paper documents into editable digital forms. It employs optical character recognition and other technologies and allows for things like e-signatures recognizable in court. Adobe Document Cloud will cost $15 per month for a single user and might, might, just help us be a little less dependent on dead trees. Well, we've covered that scary, scary, scary USB vulnerability at Black Hat and DEF CON. But unfortunately, the new MacBook's single port comes with a major security risk. Uh, did someone forget about the super scary USB vulnerability that's out in the wild now? So while Apple's new USB-C port has a whole lot of potential, it also opens up potential for hackers to slide in some truly scary stuff in the same way USB thumb drives can be made into human interface device, an HID, and insert malware onto your machine. So I guess from now on, all our USB devices are going to be eyed as potential snakes in the proverbial grass. Hey, good news. Windows 10 upgrades free for everyone. Kinda. Windows 10 has been wowing its testers, winning over Win 8 haters, and mending fences with enterprises that have a death grip on their web Win 7 installations. By all measure, Microsoft is doing this one right. And just to blow your mind, they're going to make it free to everyone with Windows 7 or 8, even if you don't have a legit copy. Now, Redmond announced that Windows 10, coming this summer, will be free to anyone using Windows 7 or better, even if their copy is illegal, though it seems that non-genuine upgrades will have annoying restrictions. This is a sharp turnabout for a company that, until very recently, put a premium on their Windows licensing revenue. There's plenty of play at the boardroom, but with a strong reason for pirates and update laggers to come in from the cold, Win 10 seems to be a no-brainer for the consumer. Now, when we come back, we're going to be jumping into our Enterprise Bytes, a little bit of a deep dive into some issues concerning IT folk around the world. But before we do that, let's go ahead and take a moment to thank the first sponsor of this episode of This Week in Enterprise Tech, and it's HipChat. Now, let me ask you something. How do you communicate? I mean, your team, your business, how do you talk to one another? Of course, there's a lot of tools out there. There's phone, there's email, there's text, there's fax, there's IM. There's, there's dozens of different really good ways for you to get data from one person to the next. But the question really is, is it right? Is it efficient? Does it promote good business practices? If it doesn't, well, you need HipChat. That's right, HipChat, it's a tool that's specifically designed for businesses. HipChat is IM, video chat, document sharing, screen sharing, system updates, and code sharing integrated into one simple platform. Email is too slow, meetings get sidetracked, and regular IM doesn't work well for groups. 
Video chat can be frustrating, and sending documents doesn't really mean anything if it's just filed in a folder never to be seen again. HipChat combines all of those tools and makes them make sense. It keeps your team in sync, it works from any device no matter where you are, and it allows you to look at the history of communication. So you can always find out where there's been a breakdown in communications or where a really good idea came from. That's part of doing business in this new century. Now, best part, HipChat integ integrates with the top developer tools like GitHub, Jira, Zendesk, and more. Go to their website and check out the 57 services that HipChat plays nice with. HipChat brings your entire project and team communications together in one place where you can focus on doing business. So here's what we want you to do. We want you to get your team on the same page in seconds. There's a freemium version that you can use free forever, but for the next 30 days, you'll get the full version of HipChat, which includes the bonus features of video and screen sharing. You can try HipChat for free, no credit card required. Just visit hipchat.com slash twiet. Sign up, click on start chatting, then invite a few team members and try it free for 30 days. And for the first 100 signups, HipChat is going to extend their 30-day free offer to 90 days. Remember, folks, that's hipchat.com slash twiet. Hipchat.com slash twiet. HipChat. Your team, your project, in sync, instantly. And we thank HipChat for their support of This Week in Enterprise Tech. Let's get back to it. Uh, Curtis Chebert, I wanted to take some time to talk a little bit about Windows licensing. A few things have happened in the last year that I think many of us didn't think would ever happen. It's been a busy year for Microsoft on many fronts. Last year, Microsoft announced that there would be a free version of Windows for devices with screens smaller than 9 inches. Microsoft also announced that there would be a free version of Windows 10 for Internet of Things things. And then, of course, just this last week, there was an announcement that Microsoft would allow for free updates for users of Windows 7 and Windows 8, even those with illegal copies, even though, again, there are restrictions if you have a non-genuine version of your of your OS. Uh, Windows has been a, a, co a profits center for Microsoft for such a long time. It's strange to see this this turnabout. Chibert, let me throw, throw this over to you first. What's this all about? I mean, it seems as if Microsoft is, is starting to say, well, Windows is a loss leader. Well, I'm not sure they're really saying it's a loss leader per se, but trying to solidify their position. Uh, unless Microsoft has the bulk of the desktops, slowly but surely, I'm pretty sure things like Linux and Mac OS X and various other flavors are going to start gaining ground. We're certainly seeing um, Chrome, you know, Google's Chrome get a lot of ground. And so by solidifying their position and making it available even for things like a Raspberry Pi 2, where you have free version of Windows Embedded 10, um, it, Microsoft really and truly wants to be the owner of the Internet of Things. And part of the owning the Internet of Things is making sure you own the desktop. All right. Uh, Curtis, all of this is happening in some fierce, fierce pressure from, as Tebert mentioned, Google Chrome on the low end and from Apple, actually OS X, on the high end, both of which have free updates for their OSs. So Microsoft was sort of the odd dog out. Yes, they have, still have huge market share, but... Could it be that they were seeing the, the, the writing on the walls and they realized that OS is now a commodity? It's raw materials and you make your money elsewhere. Well, I don't know that it's so much a commodity because look at what they haven't talked about. And that is pricing to their OEM partners. Relatively speaking, few of their licenses for Windows are just bought off the shelf. The vast majority come pre-installed on hardware. And those are going to continue to drive revenue from those OEM partners. Now, they are, in fact, giving up some revenue from the people who are updating. But I think that they are looking at the reduced maintenance and support costs of having everyone on a Windows 10 platform. And they're also drawing some lessons from the gaming community. I mean, let's think about the whole freemium model. That's a lot of what you're getting here. They'll give you the update to the operating system, give you the ability to get on this latest version of the OS because that makes it much more likely that you're going to then go ahead and give them money for a license or a subscription to their office productivity software, to some of their back-end services, to their cloud services, and all the other things that still cost money. 
Uh, I think that this is one of those cases where they can see a reduced revenue stream from this particular source and plan on more than making it up from other sources. Right, right. Now, of course, we could be looking at this at a couple of different ways. There have been several articles that are looking at the new licensing terms over at Microsoft, and many of them have come up with one of two possibilities. The first is that Microsoft would rather have the lion's share of a free or semi-free operating system and, uh, and you know, get it that way. There, there's another uh, a group that sees says that Microsoft sees this as a new reality, that your OS is just the gateway to a paid system. Uh, for example, the App Store for Apple. Uh, Tiber, let me throw this back over to you. I, I, I like what Curtis was saying, that Microsoft is probably focusing more on what they're going to get from OEMs, and this is really just a way to get everyone on the same page. So my question to you would be, why wouldn't they also offer it to Windows XP users? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> you know... Microsoft wants XP to go away, or at least that's that's what I'm reading on the wall. And uh, I I think it's you know if I was in a Microsoft manager, I'd say no, I'm sorry, XP is just too far away. We want to have at least a little bit of income coming in um, while we get rid of XP. And I think you know by making patches and updates you know go away on XP, uh, that's quite a bit of pressure to. Um, and the XP uh, genre. All right. Remember, folks, Windows 10, the first one's free. Let's go ahead and move on to the second enterprise buy. This one, actually, this is something that Curtis and I experienced firsthand. We just finished up Enterprise Connect 2015 in Orlando, Florida. Now, for those of you who are not familiar with the event, Enterprise Connect is an enterprise IT event, but it's focused around communication, specifically things like UC, Unified Communications. Now, Curtis, I want to throw this over to you first because, again, you had way more time than I to walk the floor. I was stuck in an interview booth. But one of the things that I noticed this year was WebRTC has become one of these things that everyone everyone assumes is there in some way or shape or form, but it's not quite the buzzword it used to be. Web Does that mean WebRTC is, is old news or just does it mean that WebRT is now changing into something else? I don't know that it's changing into something else. What I think it is doing is becoming an enabling technology for a lot of other things. You know, last year and year before last, when we talked about WebRTC, we were talking about, generally speaking, video calls made between web browsers. Uh, you still hear some of that. And if you go to a WebRTC session, you'll hear people talking about that. But what you're seeing much more of is WebRTC used as the base technology for other applications that simply have the video communications built in, which actually speaks in many ways to one of the other big things that was going on at Enterprise Connect. And that is the notion that in an ideal world, you don't notice the communications. They just kind of happen. It's funny because SAP has talked about the same thing in terms of analytics. Gartner was talking about this a lot at the Gartner conference back in October. The notion that a lot of these functions, whether it be analytics or communications, that we've seen as standalone apps in the past are now being rolled up into the major enterprise application, whether it be um, customer relationship manager or accounting or some sort of overarching collaborative system. Um, some people are calling it transparency. Other people are calling it simply rolling the functions up into the, the bigger applications. One way or the other, lots of enablement and much less discussion about each of these as their own program. Chibert, are you seeing that on your side, the actual deployment side, where UC is no longer a theoretical exercise and it's no longer this talk of best practices and, and forklift upgrades. It's just something that you assume is going to be part of your, your platform no matter what you're using. Yeah, you bet. And uh, one of the things that not a whole lot of people are talking about about WebRTC is previously if you're running uh, VDI or thin clients or something like that, the biggest problem is when the the audio and video codecs are on, say, the data center virtual image, uh, but the microphone and speakers are on the distant client. 
that really screws up things like echo canceling and all that other stuff. By having it pushed back to the edge using something like WebRTC, it solves an awful lot of problems. Um, so the really cool thing is, you know, it's now become an expected. If you're not playing WebRTC, you might as well pack up your marbles and go home because it's now expected by an awful lot of applications. And we're not going to move forward without a ubiquitous way of getting to those types of APIs. So, yeah, I think WebRTC is now an expected. And I think we're going to see, you know, less and less people talking about WebRTC because they're going to expect it to be there. Curtis, let's talk a little bit about that ubiquity. One of the buzzwords that did emerge this year, and I heard this quite a bit on the show floor and in the keynotes, was this idea of transparency. And the way that they were using it is, is to say that no user should ever have to use a UC platform on two or three different devices and get two or three different UIs. Everything should be the same and transparent to the user. Is, is this viable? Because something like this has been suggested for an awful long time and it never seems to pan out. Well, uh, what, what you had was p exactly right. You explained it perfectly. The notion that people can come into the enterprise with uh, a phone, a tablet, a laptop, and they should have essentially the same experience regardless of which of those platforms they choose to use at any given time. Now, there are platforms where people are getting used to this. Um, you know, Facebook looks kind of the same regardless of where you are. Uh, Skype looks very similar regardless of where you are. Google and its documents look very similar no matter where you are. The notion is that this model for the user interface should be the model that everyone adopts. Uh, and that has a couple of implications. One is that people should be using the same program, the same platform or framework, if you will, across all their devices. The other is that the operating system, the thing we were talking about just a couple of minutes ago, shouldn't matter. You know, uh, an OS X, an OS X uh, user interface, a Windows user interface, an iOS user interface, an Android user interface, all should appear to be the same when you go to communicate with someone. Um, it is a big change because it means that the company that owns that real estate on the desktop uh, no matter how big that desktop is, that company that owns that really doesn't matter so much anymore. And that's a huge shift. Uh, it's going to be interesting to see how all of this plays out because it has implications in a lot of other areas. And I, th I think we're going to talk to a couple of those in just a minute. But it, but it is a huge shift. Uh, and this is more than just a new casual buzzword that's being thrown around. Right. Chibert, another catchphrase that seems to have grown up this year was this idea of bottom-up or bringing in the user. And it's the idea that the days of just deploying a technical solution, even as one that is as good as, as many UC platforms, is over. That instead, you need to look at companies that can provide services to actually come in, speak to your users, speak to your teams, find out how they want to use the solution, customize it for those users, and deploy it that way. Is, is, well, this, is this a new idea? This doesn't seem like a new idea. It seems like an old idea rehashed. Well, I'm, I'm seeing this more than just in the collaboration or UC arena. Um, I'm seeing it in a lot of different segments. These, the corporate America or corporate world is getting a little sick and tired of systems that need third party, fourth party, second party, you know, having all these different pieces that the IT group is expected to integrate together. Uh, what the world really wants is they want simple. They want the technology to get out of the way so that they can do business. You know, I may be speaking sacrilege, but the IT world has managed to survive by making things complicated and providing job security. But the executive suites is saying, hey, uh, how come IT is, you know, sucking up so much time and resources and changes when we just want to do business. So I think the market is responding, not all, you know, in UC collaboration and so forth. They want things rolled together. They want things to look the same because training costs money, support costs money, 
it all costs money because it needs support. When it's simpler and it's consistent, it costs less money and you can concentrate more on doing business. Right, right. A last question on this before we move on, because we've actually got a very interesting <coughs> guest coming up. And that is, it's for you, Curtis. One of the other things that I saw sitting in the interview booth for three days was the rise of platforms. And actually, I believe that this was also covered in a keynote address uh, with some very high level, senior level executives from different companies providing UC. And it's, it's the rise of the platform. There's this idea that we're done with best of solutions. We don't want to take X from this company and Y from this company. As Hubert said, you know, get out of the way. Give me, give me a solution that works for my team, and I don't want to have to futz around with, with configuring it in any way, shape, or form. Now, I know there was, a, there was at least one keynote address. I had, I had them as a panel uh, who on like one side you had Cisco, Cisco's Roland Trollope who was saying, no, 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 we're still in a best of world. You take the best of breed and you combine them and you customize it for your customers. But then I, we had other execs who were saying, those days are gone. Now, that kind of UC isn't going to exist in three years. Did, did you kind of pick up this dynamic? You know, I did indeed. And I covered one of the, uh, the keynotes, that, that uh, article you were kind enough to show her earlier. And it was uh, Roland Trollope who mentioned that he has 179 different applications on his phone and uh, close to 20 of them are communications apps, uh, some of which he uses to communicate with only a certain number of people. His point is that users are accustomed to this and that we shouldn't try to, to break them away from this and force them into a single communications application or framework. The dynamic that, that Brian talked about a minute ago is really the source of the tension that I saw because on the one side, you do have the IT department that is incented by the executive suite to keep their costs down to reduce IT costs and that means making things as simple as possible. It also makes things like security and um, regulatory compliance much simpler and easier. On the other side, you have all these business units that just, as you said, want to get their stuff done. And that tends to mean using the tools that they already know how to use, which most often are tools that they're bringing from their personal lives. Trying to figure out that balance, keeping the business units happy with the tools they already know how to use and balancing it against the need to be secure and keep costs down is where we're seeing a lot of tension within the IT world today. And the problem ultimately lies in the executive suite giving conflicting instructions to different units. They need to figure it out. Uh, at that point, I think everyone's going to be happy to follow the consistent marching orders. Gentlemen, thank you very much for those Enterprise Bites. We'll be right back. We're actually coming in with Nikhil Gupta, who is the Senior Product Line Manager of Storage and Networking Operations Strategy at VMware. He's going to come on the show and tell us all about storage in a virtualized world. But before we do that, let's go ahead and take a moment to thank the second sponsor of the Twyet Riot. Now, let me ask you a question. Do you use PDFs? Well, of course you do. As we're heading to the paperless law office, everyone uses PDFs. And it's for good reason. The technology is powerful. It gives us a way to, to present consistent documents, to send them back and forth and, and actually have legal things done on them. But as everyone who has used PDFs over the last decade and some knows, they're not perfect. There are a lot of things that I wish I could do with PDFs that the technology is kind of limited and, and doesn't really allow me to do. That was until now. You see, if you want to get the most out of your PDFs, you got to use Nitro. Now, Nitro is the leading alternative to the Adobe Acrobat format. From individual users to large enterprises, Nitro gives you everything you need to easily view, create, prepare, and sign PDF files, delivering more value through a clean UI, simple deployment, and the best customer service in the business. A Nitro lets you easily connect and host documents in the Nitro cloud, enabling you to securely complete transactions with legally binding e-signatures. It also allows you to print to PDF from any application using the Nitro Pro virtual printer driver, and it features simple one-click PDF conversions to any Microsoft Office format and back again. Now imagine that. With Nitro, you can add text anywhere on a PDF document, even if it doesn't have interactive fields. And it includes a set of intuitive editing tools that let you manipulate text, change fonts, customize layouts, and more. 
Now, the engineers at Nitro base their tools on the Microsoft Office ribbon, so if you can use Word, folks, you can use Nitro. No matter if you're transforming scanned documents or images into PDF with OCR, searching through PDFs for specific pieces of information, or collaborating with colleagues and offering feedback, Nitro is the way PDFs work for you. Nitro Pro is used by over half a million businesses, including 50% of the Fortune 500. So here's what we want you to do. We want you to visit GoNitro.com slash twit. That's GoNitro.com slash twit to learn more about Nitro and their document solutions. And as a special offer for fans of twit, you can try it free for 14 days. No credit card required. That's GoNitro.com slash twit. GoNitro.com slash twit. And we thank Nitro for their support of this week in Enterprise Tech. We welcome to the show Mr. Nikhil Gupta. He's the Senior Product Line Manager for Storage and Network Operations Strategy at VMware. Nikhil, thank you very much for coming on to the show. Hello, Padre. Thanks for inviting me here. Now, we brought you on because we wanted to talk about storage, but not just any storage. We've had several storage experts come onto the show, even storage experts talking about storage in an SDN environment. But we wanted to bring up something that is near and dear to our audience's heart, and that is storage in a virtualized environment. Now, let's start out with the, the simple question. Why is storage for a network using a lot of virtualization different than traditional storage? Just a lot of boxes with a lot of drives giving me as many features as they possibly can. Yeah, so basically, uh, you know, storage has been there forever, and there are different... Uh, technologies over there. Now, as the network and everything is evolving, so is storage. And what's happening is we used to have host, and then we used to have storage network, and then it goes to arrays. Now, with that, basically, it, there is a lot of latency, and it goes out, and it's good for certain applications. But uh, when we talk about uh, virtualized storage or the new web scale applications that are happening, then uh, we are talking about hyper-converged infrastructure, which is basically involving the host and the storage together to better optimize. And uh, I was hearing about some applications such as VDI and all. So, so for that, it will be very useful. Right. And actually, that, that's that's an interesting point. When we talked about the traditional storage setup, and you know, you can go back 20, 30 years for this. You you had your storage farm. You had your boxes that were responsible for storage, and then you had the boxes that were responsible for running the processes, whatever whatever services that you needed to run. And as you have mentioned. That's kind of breaking down. We don't see the traditional one room, two room setup. We're now seeing one room with all the resources and you just allocate as needed. What what are the special challenges of doing that? Because I can imagine just off the back off the back of my head that you've got issues with security. You're gonna have issues with resource allocation. You're gonna have issues with running so many processes off the same resources that you're gonna have to come up with some interesting ways of managing that. Exactly. So that's a very good point because uh, as I was hearing Frank earlier that people and their business units who are doing things certain ways for several years and uh, that mindset needs to change and the people need to operate. So there are key three things, uh, people, process and technology. So technology I consider it as only the one third of the piece and because of the benefits that you mentioned, uh, we can that's why the industry is evolving over there. But it's the people and the processes which is the challenge, and, and you need to think outside of the box how to manage and how to operate it. All right, let's, let's go ahead and talk best practices. Our, our audience is actually pretty smart. They understand why this can be a challenge, and they understand why this is important, because we are heading to more virtualization, not less. If I was to start looking at best practices, so how would I do this in a modern data center, a modern data closet? How would I manage my storage in the same boxes that are also hosting my processes, what would it look like? So I guess, you know, you brought up a good point and there's uh, several different challenges over there. So 15 years ago, when VMware started, we had uh, compute virtualization and it was a very new topic and people didn't know what to do, right? And, and uh, people who were managing compute servers in 70s, it was a very different mindset. And then it took a while for them to adopt from the compute virtualization. Now, the network virtualization and storage virtualization just followed that. And so what's happening with that is that uh, at the end of the day, on the same host, you have compute, storage, and network. And now, if there is a DDoS attack, we are talking about security earlier. Mm -hmm. So if there is a DDoS attack, that 
increases the latency on the network side, guess what? It will also impact the storage latency. So from that perspective, where exactly the problem lies, you need to identify. So today what happens is when a IT customer, whether it's a marketing group or the sales group, they have any problem if their email is running slow, they pick up the phone and they say, okay, uh, I have a problem. So it goes to the application groups, and application group will use an application performance monitoring tool to triage the problem, and then they will say, oh, okay, the problem is not in the application, it is in the infrastructure. Now, infrastructure is now split it into two parts. It's in the virtual infrastructure and the story, uh, physical infrastructure. Now, in virtual infrastructure, to the points that you mentioned, now compute storage and network, they are all together on a single host, and so, First things first is you have to isolate where exactly the problem is. And so you do that isolation, and then once you know that the problem is on the physical uh, network or in the physical storage, that's when you will deep dive in. So these are some of the things which you probably need to change. And this is where I was saying that the organization needs to change, the processes needs to change, and so does the methodology and the operation tools. So we had, again, the storage has been there forever. There has been storage resource management tools which has been there forever. So there have been companies who are built and brought on that. But those were built for the siloed organization for their what we call it as a hardware defined data center. Now the industry is evolving towards software defined data center where virtual storage, virtual network and virtual compute is happening. And so from that perspective, you need to think outside of the box and figure out a newer ways of managing or operating those storages. Wow. Okay. Actually, that's that's. I really like that idea of the uh, of SDN can give you more flexibility in resource allocation. But most of us don't think of the fact that if someone's impacting, say, launching a DDoS attack on one of your services, they're also going to be affecting storage. That's that. Yeah. Actually, that totally makes sense. Let me bring in some of my co-hosts here, Chibert. This this is one of those things that you don't get in the SDN talk, right? I mean, they don't tell you. Oh, yeah. By the way, by linking them onto the same uh, a host. You, you could potentially be hurting uh, uh, performance as much as you're helping it. Well, I think it's going back to the old um, are all your eggs in one basket argument. Uh, one thing I, I will like to point out is in the SDN world, it's a lot easier to move things around. So if a portion of your enterprise is being DDoSed, you know, in theory, you should be able to shift around it. Um, that's something that I've been, you know, looking really hard at. And my biggest problem, you know, within the traditional network is too many people love using Q and Q, meaning VLAN in a VLAN. And that puts an awful lot of load down at the edge, uh, at the switches and routers. Um, so I don't see either solution being perfect. But I like the flexibility. I like the ability to have a lot of the processing for SDN and virtualized storage along with that, being able to move it around, being able to load down it around, and be able to have more points for diagnostics so that if something does bite me, I've got a better chance at finding it rather than the traditional infrastructures. Right. Uh, Nikki, let's talk about that. What, what are some of the best practices <laughs> in organizing and and uh, or and setting aside storage so that you can deal with adverse performance events. Yeah, and, and I'll come to that. And before that, I would like to add to what Brian said. So there are huge value add of SDN. So I'm a very strong proponent and my background is before joining VMware, I come from Cisco. So again, you know, looking at networking as well as storage, and that's one of the reason I took this role was that at the end of the day in software defined data center, everything is merging. And uh, so we have the flexibility and we have uh, features such as distributed firewall which protects all those things. And uh, because of the agility and those benefits, basically that's where the software defined data center is happening. Now the point I'm trying to make here was that, okay, there are the benefits outweighs the cons and, and this is where the operations plays a key role is that how to simplify it number one, and also uh, see that at the end of the day, if there's a problem, how to diagnose it. So I come back from telecom background. I've done 15 years with OSS, BSS with telecom vendors. And over there, 
This is nothing new. They have been doing it for 30, 35 years. And the same concept is now coming into the data center world. And, and the same thing such as uh, ability to track, providing rule-based access control or audit trails to your point. Because there could be two types of problems that could be created. One problem is by a malicious user through DDoS or somewhere else. Or the other thing could be what we used to call in uh, old days CAC error or between computer and share error. That's you had all the right intentions, but you accidentally misconfigured it. Now, with the operations perspective, that is the key benefit here, is that how do we identify that? And this is what something I highly encourage to see that is how you prevent that. And if you look at the statistics, both in virtual networking as well as virtual storage, 30 to 40% of the problems are related to configuration. Now, those are mm -hmm. low-hanging fruits. If you could prevent those things from happening, then guess what? You have saved a lot of money. Now, all this virtual storage and virtual networking are happening because it's cost effective. And so that's the main reason, and that's why I was emphasizing, and I guess the reason for today's talk is why storage operations is important and why it is different, why the needs are different for uh, the industry, how it is evolving. Absolutely. And actually, we, we don't have to reach too far into history to find out what happens when you improperly configure a, a storage node, a virtualized storage node. Look to Netflix. They, they just had that happen to them last year. They operate on a, a massive virtualized storage network that can deliver a lot of performance at any given time. And it was a single, a single misconfiguration of that storage network that brought down a large chunk of their, of their, perform, of, of their services. So when we start looking at, and this gets directly to the question, Nikhil, when we start looking at effective storage management, what do we want to see? What are the characteristics that we should be looking for? So basically, uh, that's a very good question. Uh, so if you think from the storage operator perspective, so there, in the old days, we had three personas. We had a storage admin persona, we have a virtual admin persona, and the network admin persona. And this goes back to the old business units and the silos. Now, in the virtual networking, virtual storage world, all these are combining, and we are a new uh, persona which is evolving is called SDDC persona, which you need to have understanding of compute storage and network. Now, if you are a, a SDDC persona managing virtual storage, you are expected to know little bit of compute, little bit of storage, and little bit of networking. Now, with that kind of thing, it takes years tens of years to build that kind of practice. And now, all of a sudden, you are expected to know all of it to troubleshoot virtual storage. So the visibility is very important. So what happens is if you go back, uh, the old days with the old tools, how you would do is you were used to looking at physical storage. So you will have an edge uh, switch, and then you will have a director class switch, which is going into the arrays. And you know it, you can do it troubleshooting with your eyes closed. However, when the virtual layer has happened over the host, then what happens is that where exactly the problem is, because you have data stores, you have virtual volumes, and that abstracts all the storage underlying it. So from the visibility perspective, you need to go from the host, you should be able to look at the host, you should be able to look at the storage network, and you should be able to look at the arrays. So a good operations tool or a platform should be able to look into all the three aspects, and sometimes if it is in a hyper-converged infrastructure, then you don't have the storage network uh, in between, but again, you have the host as well as the arrays. So it should be able to look at broad and shallow and figure it out and help you isolate it. Fantastic. Now, I understand that VMware actually did just release a product that, that could tie straight into this, and uh, we only have about 15 or 20 minutes left, so I, I want to give time for the demo. Our audience loves demonstration. They love to actually see what we've been talking about on the theoretical level. So can you dive in and show us what for you the ideal storage operations management will look like. Absolutely. So yeah, if you could share my screen here, uh, what I will do is I will go through uh, some of the things that we talked about. And so we'll start what were the complexity in the storage operations are. And I briefly mentioned number one thing was lacking of end-to-end -end visibility into the storage, right? So this is talking about getting an understanding of the host, the storage network, as well as the arrays. Second piece is that the current frameworks that we have, there are several protocols which are there. So those are very limited there. And last but not the least, and this is the most important point that I was saying earlier, that with compute, storage, and network all residing on the same host, the problem happens, you have to do a good uh, correlation where exactly the problem is. Because if the problem is caused by network, you don't want storage guys to be running around. 
Now, so taking a little bit deep dive on uh, the needs that I mentioned. Now, from a good tool perspective, you have to look at the performance and the availability information. That's one very key ingredient. Now, thanks to big data, there is a lot of structured and unstructured data is out there. And thanks to technologies such as Hadoop and others, you have the ability to process it. Then the third thing is the topology analysis. So as I mentioned from the visual as well as the uh, virtual as well as the physical piece, it's very important for the operator to understand that where exactly the problem is. Configuration, we spoke enough about it that there are 30 to 40 percent problems related to configuration. So first thing when a problem happens, you want to make sure that is one of the best practices which has been violated. Is any configuration that changed which should not have been changed? And last but not the least, the capacity planning. Storage out of the entire data center is the most or one of the most expensive element out there. And when the virtualization, storage virtualization happened, people go with the old mindset of allocation based storage. So by that, what I mean is when the compute virtualization happened and the application said you need four CPU to run an application. So we went ahead into the virtual compute world and we said, okay, we'll de dedicate four vCPU. Then over the period of time, we found out that, okay, we don't need four CPUs, we need it less. So in the st storage, because it's in an infancy stage, same thing is happening and the newer technologies such as dedupe and all is happening. So you really don't know where or what it could have cost. So understanding the capacity, making sure instead of allocation based, we go and look at the actual demand because instead of two terabyte, if you're using only 200 gigabyte, then what's the point of having that and you can reclaim some of them. And to top it all, it has to look at across compute, network, and storage to have a holistic understanding. Now, so this is what I was saying earlier, that you have the host, you have the storage fabrics, and then you have the arrays over there. And so VMware has a product called VRealize Operations Manager, which has over 20,000 customers today. And what we launched last week is a management pack for storage devices, which adds the support for protocols such as FC, FCOE, NFS, and iSCSI. So these are all the storage protocols which are there from, and, and it talks those different protocols and does a broad and shallow understanding to isolate the problem. We have also added uh, support for the vSAN, but that's in beta, very, very limited. We will be talking about that in future. And what it does is it gets all the information in this rich platform. It does the machine learning, generates the reports that user wants with a, a friendly user interface. This is one last thing before I get into the demo. So now we have so many storage arrays. As I, uh, there are $1.6 billion investment of venture capital just last year in storage. Now, if you have to manage and you don't want to lock yourself into one particular storage vendor, you want to have multiple storage and you want to have a tool which could look at different uh, storage and extract the information. And this is where a, huge cooperation is needed between the storage arrays and the storage operations tool. And what VMware has done is it has published their protocol called VASA 2.0 and it has a profile called IOSTAT profile. Though it's an optional profile, we highly encourage all the storage vendors to implement this, which provides the basic performance information to the operations tool. Now I will show you, uh, these are some of the uh, common complaints that we have and in interest of time, I will just flip some of these slides here. And what I will do is, uh, yeah, so here, this is the management pack for storage devices, and we have added specific dashboards, views, and reports specific to the storage admin. Uh, VI admin can use it the same. If you have been using VRealize operations, then you are very familiar. You just go to that particular uh, dashboard and drill down there. You can get a VM to a array mapping, or you can get out of the box experience. You can get the capacity details, and I'll show you some of them in the de uh, demo shortly. And then also uh, we added support for the fiber channel over ethernet. Now there are, are multiple uh, storage um, uh, fabrics such as Brocade or Cisco. So we have support for both of them. And then we added support for the NFS and iSCSI. So now in the demo, let me just show you a quick setup, what's, uh, how the demo setup looks like. So we have the, uh, we have the vSAN compatible rack servers. So these are all the host over there. It has both FC, FCOE, as well as NFS iSCSI uh, storage fabric. And then we have different uh, storage arrays supporting different protocols. And these are racks over at uh, VMware's headquarters. Yeah, yeah. So these are the setups that we had. And uh, because of the 
uh, bandwidth and I was not sure that how the connectivity is there, you know, Murphy law always kicks in. Uh, so I didn't want to make it live live demo, but what I'm doing here is I have recorded few settings uh, which I'm going to show here. And so these are the four use cases that we are going to cover. So number one thing which I mentioned was the broad storage coverage because at the end of the day, uh, there are NFS, iSCSI, FCF. So there are different uh, types of protocols and we want to make sure the storage operations tool, you should be having a broad coverage because number one, one size doesn't fit in all. So you may have a NFS iSCSI for one piece of application or one part of the network, and then you may have the SAN based network for the other part of it. But you don't want to have separate operation tools looking at both of them. And with virtualized storage coming in, you don't want a third set of tool for managing that. So as I was saying earlier, you need to have a unified tool which looks across the broad set of the uh, storage protocols. The other thing I mentioned was the end-to-end -end uh, troubleshooting. This is the key thing which you would want, and especially in the virtualized storage, is that ability to see from the VM all the way to the data store. Now, performance and latency is the nearest and dearest thing to a storage admin, so we'll show how we can look at that. And then, top consumers and errors, so at the end of the day, instead of having to go and look into your network again and again, uh, there are simple dashboards which can tell you who are the top talkers, and then based on the latency, you can figure it out. So. Let me uh, just go into the demo real quick here. Yeah, so uh, just logging in there. Okay, uh, Zach, go ahead and bug this. Okay, let me get, let me yeah, let me know when you're ready to go. Yeah, it's it's. Okay. All right. Yeah, I'm ready. Okay. So here, so uh, our product, as I mentioned, is name is VDLIs Operations, and this is the management pack for storage devices. So once you log in here, this is the dashboard that you will see, and in the dashboard, as you can see, there are different types of protocols. So we have FC, FCOE, we have the component usage, troubleshooting component heat map, then we have the support for iSCSI, NFS, and then also the virtual SAN. So for each of them, as I mentioned, that we have separate dashboards and we could go and select one of the uh, dashboards that you want to look and it will bring it up. So let me show you the next one. Yeah, just, just describe what's uh, the, the process that's going on. Got it, got it. So here, give me one second. Oops. So here, uh, as I mentioned earlier, that we had the dashboards, different dashboard views were there. And, and in this particular way, we are saying how we can do an end-to-end -end troubleshooting. So we have the virtual SAN topology. So as I was mentioning earlier, that the visibility of how your VM is mapped all the way to the data store is very important because data store is a virtual uh, abstraction layer which keeps the underlying storage transparent to you. But when you are troubleshooting it, you really need to know that from the virtual SAN perspective, how it is connected to the host system, how it's connected to the virtual machine, the data store, host adapter, and disk groups here. And again, uh, this is uh, support is in the beta here with a very, very limited audience. Um, I just wanted to show a preview here and we will have a, a follow-up session with much more detailed information on that. As you can see here, that you can go up at the batch level and you can see the workload, anomalies. So these are the different types of information you can get for each of the components here. And then you can check the health of the status over here that, uh, you know, whether it's a severe, it's a critical problem, or what kind of problem it is. And then if you select one particular uh, cluster, then here you can see how exactly it is mapped. 
So then I'll I'll go to the different one, uh, which is a little bit more interesting here. This was primarily just showing the visibility. So again, um, as I was saying, from the performance and the latency perspective, so anything it's very easy. You go to the dashboard, and in the dashboard, basically you go and select. So in this particular case, we are selecting the NFS, and then we go to the component heat map. So where basically you will simply go into the heat map over here, and as you can see, you have the configuration and throughput latency for the NFS volumes. You also have the information for the IP switch port throughput. So all this information is very important. And then we have the e ESX PNIC. So this is the PNIC on the host. And then within the configuration, you can actually drill down. And, and so I'm just trying to sync up with the recording here. Now, the other important thing, as you may have noticed, is that when you do a mouse over, you get all the information on the IP switch port. So it will tell you the IP switch port information. Then the size of the cube here, rectangle here, shows the usage. And the color shows the workload. So by that, what I mean is, it, since it's all green, it's all good. Whereas if it was uh, there was some problem, as you can see here, that it could be yellow or red over there. So what exactly are we saying? I mean, this is this is how you allocate storage to certain processes? No, so what we are showing here is that how it is currently configured. So when you say uh, you have configured a storage, so you can go, there are different pieces to here, right? So since this type of storage was the NFS storage, so we are looking into NFS volume. And the important thing for over there is to find out what's the throughput and latency is. So that is what you can see here. Now, the problem could be anywhere in the link. And, and this is what I meant by end-to-end -end configuration, is you have, you have to see. Now, assuming if there was a problem somewhere in the switch port, you could have easily figured out that, OK, if this was red here, that means there was a problem. So the uh, view that I had showed earlier, that was the um, environment view where you could select and say, OK, this particular VM, oh, you could have gone all the way back tracing where exactly which data store is connected. And that is the visibility piece I was mentioning about, because that's, again, very important in virtual world. Uh, you don't know where exactly the problem is. So for instance, let's say if we know the problem is in a particular disk and array, then only you can go and fix it, versus uh, if you're looking at the virtual world at an abstraction level, then it's very hard. You kind of go blind where it is. So this is uh, the tool, as I was saying, that which is um, for broad and shallow for helping you triage the problem. Because I don't see that the industry uh, evolving to a point where there is no need for storage admin and the SDDC admin will be troubleshooting all. Uh, the physical hardware will always be there, no longer, uh, no matter if how much SDS comes in. Those are uh, the software which is enabling the underlying hardware. So that right. will continue to exist. Uh, let, let me bring up a question that we're going to have from, from IT people. And actually, this was brought up by uh, Specs in the chat room, who wants to know if a tool like this, being able to look at the, the minutia of your storage array, would help you figure out exactly where a problem might exist and might help you, for example, to diagnose the reason why particular end users are having difficulty or high latency in getting to the services that they need to get to. Yeah, so uh, as I said, like this particular tool is very powerful from isolation perspective. So using one of the views that I mentioned earlier, you can actually track back. So if you take a step back, how it happens in the real world is that the application team will receive a call stating that I have a problem in my, let's say, Microsoft Exchange or on my Oracle application. And, and it's too slow when I'm trying to do the response time is very high. Now, so the f user flow would be, then it goes to the application team. An application team, as I said, look into the application performance. And at some point, it will boil down to the virtual machine. Now, once it goes to the virtual machine, they will be calling the infrastructure team. So if you look at the IT organization, they are broken down at two levels. One is the application, and the other is infrastructure. Now, in the infrastructure, it's further broke down, broken down into virtual infrastructure and physical infrastructure. So for instance, like if you know that the problem is happening, and once you know which particular VM it has, then you can drill down further 
and uh, eventually like by looking at the PNIC, you can get to that. Now, depending upon if you are asking about at a very particular individual customer level, that gets into the consumer because uh, uh, that is the application level information. Uh, and, and again, without understanding the complete context, uh, I'm not sure if I, uh, uh, I, I gave you the complete answer, but that's a uh, high level background. Right. Uh, Cheaper, let me let me bring you into this because we do have a question from, I believe it was uh, what, Synac or uh, Max123 in the chat room, I can't remember, uh, <laughs> talking about how, uh, you know, does this make old networking analysis tools obsolete? Because it, in some way, most of the tools that we've played with look at specific services, look at specific metrics that don't necessarily take in uh, into account that the services may be run, running in a virtualized environment. And the second question that's a corollary to that is, I know that you run a lot of things in Hyper-V. Uh, is there a similar tool on that end? So, uh, oh, okay. Uh, sorry. The, the, no, uh, yeah, it, uh, it, it's actually both of us, because the reality is, is, yeah, there are some very similar tools in the Hyper-V world. And uh, the, the, the bottom line is the traditional tools it's it's the forest and the trees type of thing. You need a f you need to be able to take a step back and look at the infrastructure as a whole, and then drill down. Whereas a lot of the original tools, they just say, "Oh, um, this tree's got rot, and you know, let's go and fix it." Um, no, we need to look at the enterprise as a whole and see the bigger picture, and that's what a lot of these new tools are all about. Right. Right. Uh, Curtis, let me bring you in here because we're getting close to the end of the episode. And I, I want to know from from the Information Week side, from the executive side, uh, I actually had this conversation with Nikhil earlier uh, before the show. Uh, most CTOs and CIOs just want to hear what's my cost, what's my ROI, exactly what is this going to allow us to do. Uh, do w when they look at tools like this from VMware, when they look at virtualization, what is the general consensus about whether or not this is something that they're going to spend on? Well, I think that originally the the conditions that are the, the things that you talked about were precisely at just, you know, what's the basic cost? What's my ROI? Th that ROI calculation, I think, is changing because as we've heard throughout this discussion, configuration matters a lot. Now, there are tools to make it easier, but... It is entirely possible, especially when you start bringing the network and storage into the virtualized realm to misconfigure things. And a single misconfiguration can throw all of your ROI calculations out the window. So I think what we're seeing more and more are executives start, starting to ask the questions, okay, I know what the hardware cost is going to be. You've told me what the licensing cost is going to be, what I can do. But what am I going to have to do with my staff in order to really make best use of this? And, and to me, that's the piece that more and more people are starting to look at and look at pretty closely as they hear stories about both what can go right and make their life worthwhile and what can go wrong and cause horrible problems through virtualization. Right. Right. Uh, gentlemen, I'm sorry, but we actually have reached the end of the episode. I'm sorry uh, you've, list, you've wasted, well, I'll say you used an hour to listen to the best dang enterprise podcast in the world. That's according to nine out of 10 virtualized environments. Uh, now, we will have Nikhil back on in two weeks. We want to continue this. He'll be talking about a different product at the time, but we want to do a deep dive on what makes virtualized storage and VMware that much more special. Nico, let's start with you. First, could you please tell the folks at home where they can find out more information? I know that this was just scratching the surface of what VMware has to offer, but if they wanted to find out more about you or find out more about your blog or more about VMware, where can they go? Sure. Uh, thanks, Padre. It was very interesting. And uh, yeah, the time just flew by. Uh, I will share that uh, link for the blog in a minute. And I would like to just add one point to Curtis because Curtis added, uh, brought up a very good point about the people. And if you look at the statistics, uh, if the company spends $100 today in a year, 40% goes to uh, operations. Out of that, 26% is for uh, people and 14% for the software. And if you look at the life cycle, which is a typical uh, life cycle for any infrastructure over a period of four years, the OPEX is 
twice as much as the CapEx. So that's huge, huge, and that's going to be more and more relevant. So uh, you brought up a very good point that whenever you're considering a tool, you have to look at not only the direct CapEx cost, that you also have to look at the OPEX and the hidden cost. So again, and maybe in the subsequent uh, session that we have, I can drill down a little bit more on that. But with that said, let me just, uh, if you can share my screen here, I'll share the blog here. We can go to the VMware blog uh, and look for my name over there. Or you can, uh, my Twitter is here, or you can also find me on LinkedIn. And from any of those places, you can actually go to the uh, blog. So uh, I just blogged uh, recently about the new product, and I'll encourage if you are already a product uh, user, or if you're not, uh, just download a free version or a trial version and try it out. And uh, you have my information. I would love to get feedback. And uh, I'm very open to any of this uh, kind of information. But thanks again, Padre. It was very, very uh, int interesting conversation. And thanks, Curtis. And thanks, uh, Brian. Nikhil Gupta, Senior Product Line Manager, ma Manager for Storage and Network Operations Strategy over at VMware. Thank you very much. We'll see you again. And uh, we'll, bring, we'll bring more of the, the fun next time. Now, also, I'd like to thank my other panelists, my very good friends, starting with Mr. Brian Chi. Chibert, what should the Twyat Riot know about you? I know that you're, you're getting packed up. You're putting everything in your lab into two suitcases and coming over to California. What's that for again? Well, it's for Interop Hot Stage. It's where we build, I think we're still considered the world's largest temporary network. And we build that in a super secret location in South San Francisco in a big giant warehouse. And... Wow right down to doing plugs out tests. We, um, the lead engineer actually shuts down the power and makes sure everything shuts down correctly. And then we pack it up in a truck and ship it to Las Vegas. Come and see us at the InteropNet Knock. We'd love to have you in the InteropNet Tour and also some of the InteropNet Classrooms where we're delivering all kinds of really good educational content. Also, if you happen to be in the Bay Area, you could probably find our super secret warehouse. Just look for... The quadcopters. I'm bringing my arm, uh, my uh, Air Force over to the warehouse, and we're going to see what kind of damage we can do in the middle of an industrial area. Speaking of damage in an industrial area, Curtis Franklin, you are also packing the contents of your house into one suitcase because you are far more efficient than Chiebert. Uh, where can we find you in the coming week, and uh, what stories are you working on? Padre, I'm going to be working on a number of stories coming out of Enterprise Connect, still doing those. And I've got a couple of uh, interesting stories coming up looking forward to Interop. One of the ones that uh, I'm looking for, I'm in the process of setting up um, an interview with Chris Anderson, former chief editor at Wired and now a leading drone maker. Uh, that should be an interesting interview. That'll be coming up soon. Lots of radio going on around Interop, and uh, just follow my Twitter handle down there, and you'll be able to get all the URLs and listen in to all that great radio straight from the warehouse at Hot Stage. Brian, Curtis, Nikhil, thank you so very much. Also, thank you to you. That's right, the person who watches us every week live or downloads our episodes to listen or watch in the car, at the office, or wherever <coughs> you may be. If it weren't for you, we wouldn't have a show, so we want to make sure you can get all the episodes of This Week in Enterprise Tech that you want. Just go to our show page at twit.tv slash twiet, and there you'll find not just all of our back episodes, along with the links of the stories that we cover in each and every single episode, not just all, all of the episodes from, from days past, but also a drop-down menu that will give you a way to subscribe so that This Week in Enterprise Tech is automatically downloaded in the version you want to the device of your choice. That's right. If you want our audio version in your phone so you can listen in the car on the way to work, or maybe on your tablet, the video version, so you can watch us on your break, or maybe you want the high-def version on your laptop or PC so you can watch us on the big screen when you get home. It's all there at twit.tv slash twiet. Also, don't forget that you can follow me on Twitter. Just go to twitter.com slash padresj. There you will find what I do on the Twit TV network each week and, well, what I do when I'm not on the air. That's right. It's, it's a great way to follow me and find out what we're going to be doing on This Week in Enterprise Tech or on Padres Corner on, or on Know How or on Coding 101 or on Before You Buy. That's right. Twitter.com slash padresj. That's at Padre SJ. Don't forget that we do this show live every week at Friday at 1 o'clock p.m. Pacific time. Just drop in at live.twit.tv and you can see 
everything that happens that gets edited out of the downloaded version. You can see the the uh, pre-show, the post-show, and all the bloopers that happen in the middle. And the show actually had a couple of bloopers. So if you didn't watch it live, you missed it. Just go to uh, live.twit.tv. And as long as you're there, jump into our chat room at irc.twit.tv. It's a great way to communicate with me, with the co-host, and with our guests. So if you've ever had a question about one of the topics that we're covering and you're not watching live and being in the chat room, well, you have no one to blame but yourself. Finally, we want to thank everyone who makes this show possible. Of course, to Leo, to Lisa, the, who let me do this show, to my super producer, Karsten Bondi, and of course, to my TD. That's right. We call him Eskimo Zach, or in the studio, we call him Hey You. Zach, could you please tell the folks at home where they can find you if they want to find out more about what you do here for Twit TV? You can find me on Twitter at EskimoZach. That's E-S-K-I-M-O-Z-A-C-H. Thank you so much, Padre. Yes, and one last note on that. If you ever get interested in, in what goes on behind the TD's desk, make sure to ping Zach on Twitter and, and say, hey, it's all your fault. Now, on that note, this, I'm Father Robert Balliser. This has been This Week in Enterprise Tech. And just remember, if you want to know what's going on in the enterprise, just keep quiet.